Well, I have with me uh, Nigel Wright, one-time principal at Spurgeon's College, but for the last seven years, Nigel has been living the life of retirement. Nigel, this retirement business, is it one foot in the grave or is it living life to the full? Well, I think it's a bit of both. Um, I'm conscious that I am in the eighth decade of my life and therefore the uh, segment of life that I have yet to live is quite a lot smaller than what I've already lived. And it, I would be lying if I didn't say that uh, death is in my thoughts from time to time. Um, it's not a thought I welcome. Uh, I don't like to think of being dead. I can't imagine being dead, but I know that one day I will die, as we all do. So yes, uh, I suppose I am in the antechamber to eternity, so to speak. Um, but in another way, that gives me every reason to want to live well and to enjoy the time that I've got and uh, to make the most of it. And I do feel that we all have a responsibility to, uh, to enjoy life, um, to benefit from it, to add to it and to leave a good legacy behind. That's, that's something that certainly is in my mind, that the people I love most should know that I love them and I should leave them with the memory of having been loved and that that will continue with them throughout the rest of their lives. So it's it's a bit of both, John. Okay, so I mean, great to leave that legacy of being loved and, and somebody who has love, but are you, are you really retired? Um, I've been working, I reckon, half time, um, but I've not been being paid half time, regrettably. <laughs> um, when I uh, retired, I, I was open to taking a part time job uh, if there was something that I would find interesting and profitable, uh, profitable in the sense of uh, yielding interesting things and making a contribution. Uh, that never materialized, but lots of other things came along. And if you add to that um, the time I've spent studying for just out of interest, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, reading theology, then that certainly adds up to a half-time job. Right. I mean, you know, a minister might get to retirement age and think, well, you know, I've read enough books and I've done enough theology. So why, why theology and retirement? Well, I find theology interesting and the source of an infinite number of questions so i do it not because i have to but because i'm interested in it and also because i've been aware you know, you know that i've spent half my life as an academic as a teacher and the other half as a pastor and um i'm aware of all the books i haven't read in fact i'm appalled by the number of books i haven't read and every time i look there are more books out there that need to be read so uh yes in a certain sense i'm filling in gaps that i should have filled in if i were a true uh, genuine academic many years ago actually i guess most academics are pretty much like me in that you have to decide what's of interest for your subject and stick with that and not go too far outside it but what would you say to the local pastor who um, has probably not been of the academic mindset of your own um, and is thinking, I've just done enough theology? And why, why, what, does, what does theology say about retirement? Um, well, I, if somebody says that, then they say that because uh, I don't think everybody's got the same kind of intelligence. Um, I was talking to a man in Weatherspoons this morning. I was reading a book and underlining it, and he asked me what I was underlining, and it was actually a commentary on the New Testament. And then he told me he'd got dyslexia and that he could never get on with books. But as a, as a carpenter, as a joiner, uh, he had a very high level of intelligence uh, that he could envisage a bookcase or something that needed making in a way that I never could do. So I don't think everybody has to have the same kind of intelligence. And I just happen to have that kind. And people should pursue what, what, what gives them life, what, uh, what's, what's interesting for them. Of course, if they are pastors, then they are dealing with the knowledge of God. And so they have a higher level of responsibility to know what they are talking about. So when you say that, I mean, that is, that's not only surely for retired ministers or people approaching retired, but maybe for those who, as pastors, will pastor those who are retired ministers in their congregation. Yes, well, it's part of our discipline. It should be part of our discipline to the extent of our ability to uh, to seek to inform ourselves more fully and to to communicate that with a degree of excitement. You know, they say about uh, you can always tell 
when a minister died theologically by the books on his or her bookshelf. And I've noticed that that is actually true. You can tell that beyond a certain point, certain people have not thought beyond what they learned 30 years ago or so. And that's a pity because, uh, well, there's a huge amount of good stuff out there. Mm. Yeah. And I know that you want to talk to us on the 1st of July, not only about theology and retirement, but also about psychology. Why, why do you want to do that? Well, what does it feel like to be retired? What, what goes on in your own psyche when you face this change of life? And uh, I use the word psychology. I hope nobody gets the impression that I'm any kind of qualified or clinical psychologist. I'm not. Um, but I am able to draw upon my own experience and draw upon the experience of other people and hopefully say something worthwhile about the processes we go through when we are in this new situation. Right. Nigel, thank you. I look forward to hearing so much more when uh, you zoom in with us on the 1st of July and we explore issues of retirement and theology and psychology. And, and God bless you in your preparation for that. And we look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, John. I look forward to zooming in. <laughs>